Good evening. It is my proud privilege on behalf of the DS Borkar Memorial Foundation to welcome all of you, ladies, gentlemen, and fellow members of the India International Center, to the 25th DS Borkar Memorial Lecture. For 22 years, we have met today on 24th August at the Deshmukh Auditorium of IIC. Oh, is it echoing? Okay. I, I think I could have a go without it. Okay. Okay. How how's it now? It's better. Okay, we'll then just, sorry for the faux pas, we'll try with some housekeeping rules uh, and go with them first. Could I please request you to switch off your mobile phones because it's very disturbing to the speakers. How's the mic now? Okay, great. We'll open today's program with the presentation of the Angvastram to Justice A.P. Shah by Shri Suhas Borkar. And the presentation of the Angvastram to Justice Sanjay Kishan called by my mother, Sudha Borkar. And, and I have the privilege of doing that for Anoop, uh, Surendranath, so I'll just come down the stage and do it. And presentation of the planter to Justice A.P. Shah by my daughter Avya. And to Justice Sanjay Kishan call by Adyapat. And to Anoop by Avya again.
It is my proud privilege on behalf of the DS Borkar Memorial Foundation to welcome all of you, ladies, gentlemen, and fellow members of the India International Center to the 25th DS Borkar Memorial Lecture. For 22 years, we have met today on the 24th of August at the Deshmukh Auditorium at IIC for the lecture in memory of Dadaji. Only for two years, 2020 and 21, due to the COVID pandemic, we held the function via special webinar. The pandemic led to a new normal, with some value additions like special webcasts, which led more around the world to join us. Keeping this larger audience in mind, this year we are holding the function physically at IIC, as well as via a special hybrid platform linked live on the YouTube channel. For this 25th lecture, we all, my parents, Suhas and Sudha, me, my family, and my younger sister, Girija, with her family, have joined from Washington, D.C. on this webcast. We are all here to welcome you. I now have the privileged opportunity to introduce Professor Anup Surendranath, whom I've known since my Oxford days. In fact, he was one of the few people who welcomed me for my matriculation, and I was just sharing that tale. Um, Anup shall be introducing the 25th DS Borkar Memorial Lecture. The speaker, Justice A. Anoop is a pref professor at, of law at the National Law University, Delhi, where he's also the executive director of Project 39A and the SK Malik Chair Professor on Access to Justice. Project 39A, as most of us know, is a criminal justice program that undertakes extensive pro bono legal representation for prisoners sentenced to death and under trial prisoners. Its work has been absolutely seminal and stupendous, which has been cited by the Supreme Court of India, the Law Commission of India in parliamentary debates, and also by the UN Secretary General and the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights. Its work has resulted in the acquittal of 16 death row prisoners and a reduction in punishment for nearly 50 other death row prisoners. Professor Surendranath was invited by the former Chief Justice R.M. Loda to be the Deputy Registrar Research at the Supreme Court of India in May 2014, a position he held till 2015. Academic was appointed to this position after nearly three decades, which was last time in the 1980s. He's completed his undergraduate degree from Nalsar University of Law, Hyderabad, and then completed his BCL with distinction, an MPhil in law with distinction, and then a DPhil in law, uh, on the Felix Scholarship from the University of Oxford. He's been at NLU Delhi since 2012 and teaches criminal law, evidence law, and constitutional law. Now over to him. Thank you so much. We really thought you were the ideal choice for this. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. That's my younger sister who's joining us from Washington. I think we're still sort of getting a hang of this. Thank you for staying with us and patiently waiting while she joins.
Yes, yes, just half a second. She would really be very uh, sort of uh, to not be able to join. Just one minute, please. Yeah, no, no, she. Yeah, there she is. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. She's been sort of coordinating. I know, Giru, we can't hear you. Yes, yes, we are. I think we'll probably just uh, yes. proceed because I think all of us are waiting. So Anoop, I would request you. Yeah, and I think she agrees wholeheartedly. Uh, I can make that out. Uh, so uh, Anoop, please, apologies for this delay. Good evening, everyone, and welcome once again. It's my absolute privilege to introduce the lecture series, uh, introduce Mr. D.S. Borker and also the speakers we have this evening. Um, my vision of India, 2040, 2047 AD, uh, the D.S. Borker Memorial Lecture Series moves relentlessly towards 2047, year after year, and today it is a 25th lecture and 24 years to go before we reach 2047, 100 years of independence, when it shall be the 49th lecture in this series. Uh, a civil society initiative instituted in 1999, the lecture is held in the memory of D.S. Borker, civil servant and public sector administrator on, uh, today at the India International Center. Um, DSV or NAAT, uh, known to friends, and before I get into uh, the introduction itself, I think uh, this is an act of uh, remembering, it's an act of memory, and I think that act of remembrance is very important, and uh, you know, uh, one is reminded of what uh, Eli Weisel said, that uh, without memory there is no culture, and without memory there would be no civilization, no society, and no future. So uh, as much as it might seem uh, a formality, I think there's a certain importance to remembrance and there's a certain importance to memory, and I hope you'll indulge me uh, through this uh, introduction. Uh, so DSB or Nath, uh, uh, as known to friends, was a civil servant, a public sector administrator, a strong advocate of physical education for India, a proponent of the idea of play streets in Indian cities, a secular democrat, and always ready to stand up for the poor and the weak, and above all, a man known for his human approach and simplicity. Uh, Mr. Borker was by all accounts a brilliant civil servant who contributed enormously to public policy and governance during his long stint in public management. Uh, the repeated uh, attendance in these lecture series throughout the years are an eloquent testimony to his qualities of head and heart. Borker, born in Bombay on 17th August 1911, he had his early education in Bombay and went to England for his further studies. <coughs> Upon India's independence, 
uh, DSP joined as the private secretary to N.V. Gargil, a member of uh, Nehru's first union cabinet and worked with great dedication and sincerity of purpose. There is an incident uh, which uh, is pertaining to the post-partition period when Delhi was still in the throes of communal riots, it's which is recorded in public management. management. Uh, the repeated uh, attendance in these the lecture series throughout, throughout the years are an eloquent testimony to its qualities of head and heart. Born in Bombay, member of the Working Committee and Central Parliamentary Board of the All India Muslim League and a close associate of Muhammad Ali Jinnah. DSB saved the life of Hussein Imam from desperate mobs and personally escorted him to Safdarjung Airport and put him on a plane to Patna in September 1947 at grave risk to his own life. Such was DSB's commitment to values he held. This pertaining to the post-partition interest in life, particularly physical education, in 1945 <laughs> 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 Uh, working in the Planning Commission's Committee on Plan Projects. He also worked in public sector organizations like Hindustan Steel, where he was the first officer to join, and later in the State Trading Corporation, Fertilizers Corporation, and Engineers India. A versatile personality indeed, the Borker family can legitimately feel proud of these tremendous achievements of DSP. The idea behind the DS Borker Memorial Lecture Series on My Vision of India 2047 AD is to strengthen our secular democratic values and traditions and encourage the process of thinking regarding the kind of India we want in 2047 and the path to getting there, a hundred years after independence from colonialism. This series is unique in that it has consistently showcased ideas and forward-looking agendas, often contrarian ideas and agendas across a remarkable spectrum. Debate, after all, is an intrinsic value and intrinsic and valuable part of a democratic and secular India. DS Borker's two sons, Shekhar and Suhas, had initiated this lecture series in 1999. Shekhar passed away in January 2015 and this is the eighth time the lecture is being held without Shekhar. Speaking on the 25th Memorial Day of DSB while delivering the sixth DSB lecture in 2004, K.R. Narayanan, the former president of India, said, Sri Borkar was a remarkable public servant and very few public servants have such lectures instituted in their names in Delhi. This is a tribute to his ideas, to his identity with the larger causes of India and to his great intellect and sympathy for the people and their problems. I want to pay tribute to this remarkable public servant who had made an impact on this somewhat skeptical city which is Delhi and this impact is a lasting impact. Now we come to uh, this year's lecture to be delivered today by Justice Sanjay Kishan Kaul, the former president of India. It's only cliche to say that both of them don't need any introduction, uh, but I guess it would serve us all well to remind uh, ourselves of their legal and judicial journeys and, and the tremendous contribution that they have made uh, to civil liberties in this country. Um, Justice A.P. Shah did his graduation from uh, Sholapur and obtained his law degree from Government Law College, Mumbai. After a short span of practice at the Sholapur District Court, Justice Shah shifted to the Bombay High Court in 1977 and joined the chambers of the then leading advocate uh, Sri S.C. Pratap. He gained experience in civil, constitu civil constitutional service and labor matters. Justice Shah was appointed an additional judge of the Bombay High Court in 1992 and became a permanent judge in 1994. Later. He was appointed as Chief Justice of Madras High Court in 2005 and was transferred as the Chief Justice of Delhi High Court in 2008, the position from where he retired in 2010. 
In 2011, he became the founding chairperson of the Broadcasting Content Complaints Council set up by the Indian Broadcasting Foundation. He was appointed chairperson of the 20th Law Commission of India uh, in 2013. Justice A.P. Shah had a distinguished tenure as an activist jurist, if I may use that phrase, uh, and won international acclaim when he delivered a historic verdict uh, in July 2009, decriminalizing uh, uh, Section 377 and reading it down of the Indian Penal Code. Uh, his rulings have brought very fundamental facilities for prisoners, low-floor buses and railway station ramps for disabled, and has protected the freedom of expression for creative artists. As Madras High Court Chief Justice, he ushered in reforms in prisons, juvenile homes, and observation homes for women. As Acting Chief Justice of Bombay High Court, he opened up a new world to toddlers living with their mothers in uh, Mumbai's Baikala Jail and directed the government to create an Anganwadi in the staff quarters. A strong votary of freedom of speech, Justice Shah has held. Our courts have consistently maintained that this is the most precious of all our rights, the art of democracy, the lifeline of any democratic institution. As Chief Justice of Delhi High Court, uh, he very interestingly held that the office of the Chief Justice of India uh, had to come under the jurisdiction of the Right to Information Act. Justice Shah, one can say today, has truly lived up to the motto of his law college, Government Law College, Mumbai, the same law college which produced Bal Gangadhar Tilak and also Baba Sahib Bhimrao Ambedkar and also six Chief Justices of India. The motto of the college he has truly lived up to his name, Vile Fano, which means let no evil enter. Thank you, uh, Justice A.P. Shah, for being here today. Uh, Justice Sanjay Kishan Kaul is a judge uh, of the Supreme Court of India, uh, and I'll now introduce him. After graduating from St. Stephen's College, Delhi, Justice Sanjay Kishan Kaul obtained his law degree from Delhi University in 1982. He then took a practice in the Delhi High Court and the Supreme Court of India. He was designated as a senior advocate in 1999, and during his 19-year career as a lawyer, he mainly handled commercial, civil, writ, original, and company matters in the courts. Justice Call was appointed as additional judge of the Delhi High Court uh, in 2001 and was made a permanent judge in 2003. In 2013, he was elevated as Chief Justice of the Punjab and Haryana High Court, and in 2014, he was appointed Chief Justice of the Madras High Court. He was appointed as a judge of the Supreme Court of India in 2017, and Justice Call is also now the executive uh, chairperson of the National Legal Services Authority, uh, constituted under the Legal Services Authorities Act 1987, to provide free legal aid services to weaker sections of the society. In 2017, on 24th August, exactly six years to this day, Justice Call and eight other judges ruled in favor of privacy being a fundamental right in, under the Indian Constitution and is undoubted and undoubtedly will be a watershed moment uh, in the Constitution history of this country. In the 2008 judgment, when he was a judge in the Delhi High Court, Justice Call dismissed charges uh, levied against uh, M.F. Hussain for his painting of a lady later termed as Bharat Mata, accusing, uh, accusing M.F. Hussain of obscenity. Upholding free speech and expression, Justice Call expressed agreement with his, uh, M.F. Hussain's contention that there was no deliberate intention on his part to hurt anybody's religious uh, feelings. Justice Call, in his judgment, said, pluralism is the soul of democracy. There should be, there should be freedom for the thought we hate, Freedom of speech has no meaning if there is no freedom after speech. The reality of democracy is to be measured by the extent of freedom and accommodation it extends. Interestingly, both uh, justices here today have a unique association with each other. Uh, when Justice Shah was the Chief Justice of Delhi High Court, Justice Call was a judge in the same court. Both of them also served as Chief Justices of the Madras High Court, and undoubtedly both of them are strong defenders of the freedom of speech and expression. On that note, may I now request Justice A.P. Shah to deliver the 25th D.S. Worker Memorial Lecture on My Vision of India 2047. Justice Shah, over to you. Justice Sanjay Kishan Kaur, 
Mr. Anup Surendranath, members of Borkar family, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for being here. And thanks also to the Borkar family for inviting me to deliver the Borkar Memorial Lecture. Yes, Borkar was a distinguished civil servant and public educator who was always focused on the future and especially the youth of our country. It is an honor to be here to celebrate the legacy of Shri visionary like Shri Borkar and also push ourselves to think uh, more like him for what lies ahead for India. Fittingly, the Borkar Memorial Lecture is forward looking and asks speakers to speak on one subject only. That is my vision for India 2047 AD. This topic asks a question which is at once deeply personal and deeply political. It asks me what my vision is, but also asks what my vision is for India. Addressing this in any meaningful way requires engaging with the past, present, and the future or at once. 2023 is a particularly interesting year for this discussion. India is over 75 years into life as a constitutional democracy. And enough markers, social, political, and economic, exist to examine whether our constitutional promises have been sufficiently secured and upheld for all our people. There are certain things about this country I am extremely proud of, such as the transformative contribution made in the fields of science and technology, whether it is space science or IT or even the growth of infrastructure <coughs> over the last 30 years especially. Like millions of Indians, my wife and I cried with joy when Chandrayaan 3 landed on the moon. I remember our science teacher in school, a sort of a dreamer, who showed us the world beyond the skies, introducing us to NASA and the Indian space projects led by Baba and Sarabhai. Yesterday's moon landing was an emotional moment for all of us. However, I am deeply troubled by many other things. If you look deeper, it seems to me that India's society and institutions are in a state of unprecedented disruption, in fact, a crisis. Some argue that democracy here is dying a slow death. Democratic principles have not been directly or explicitly subverted, but in the past decade, Democratic institutions and accountability mechanisms have been neutralized or compromised. There has been an insidious harvesting of a culture of hate, leading to active theaters of violence. Polarization is unrestrained, vilifying minorities, with the majority being made to think of the other, especially Muslims, as the enemy whether in Haridwar or Haryana or elsewhere. A general sentiment of hatred of minorities can be heard, seen and felt across the country. But how did we reach here? How did we manage to get it so wrong? Philosophers, politicians, public intellectuals remind us that where we are today is usually because we have forgotten the past. The philosopher Santana had said, those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. Similarly, Churchill wrote that those that fail to learn from history are doomed to repeat it. In the same spirit, asking what one's vision for India is requires considering what the idea of India was in fact in the first place. In 1947, the social, political, cultural scene was as crowded 
and as basic as you would imagine it to be. India's national movement was born in a melting pot of shifting cultural values and increasing pressures for social and political change. Where thinkers set out to define their idea of free India and find their meaning of nationalism. The word nationalism encompasses many meanings. It can mean progressive, revolutionary, pro-people or even regressive or jingoistic nationalism. Hitler's nationalism, while different from Gandhi's, was nevertheless nationalism. But we can safely say that the Indian concept of nationalism emerged in opposition to the imperialist British state and anti-colonial nationalism, where identity was not tied to religion, caste or language, but to unified demand for freedom. Efforts to define free India tried to assimilate positive aspects of both Western and Indian traditions. Notably, thinkers like Vivekananda, Tagore and Arvindo, besides Gandhi of course, in their own ways arrived at ideas of free India, responding to a dynamic socio-cultural milieu and a frenetic pace of political change. Vivekananda for instance said, and I quote his words, several dangers are in the way. And one is that of the extreme conception that we are the people in the world. With all my love for India and with all my patriotism and veneration for the ancients, I cannot but think that we have to learn many things from other nations. We must be always ready to sit at the feet of all, for mark you, everyone can teach us great lessons. Tagore's concern was <coughs> the suddenness with which we stepped into another era with its new meanings and new values, and that there was still no deep awareness of human rights, human dignity, and class equality. For Arvindo, liberty and equality were watchwords of humanity which could remold nations and governments. These thinkers exhibit consistent motives for what free India must strive for, social and political freedoms, equality, fraternity and dignity and so on. They also recognized certain obstacles that lay in the way, such as orthodoxy and superstition leading to discriminations like untouchability. At the same time, Hindu revivalists relied on an imagined glorious Indian past as a template for the future. I must mention as an aside that my grandfather was the president of the Hindu Mahasabha in 1940s. The earliest literature I read as a young boy in school was Savarkar. When I fell in love with his initial poetry, though his later poems became highly sensitized and tedious to read. Savarkar's poetry was one of my subjects in graduation. Savarkar envisaged a nation under Hindu rule, a Hindu Rashtra in Akhanda Bharat, a united India. It was premised on the belief that only Hindus can claim India's territory as the land of their ancestry. Pitru Bhumi and of their religion, Purnya Bhumi. Muslims and Christians are foreigners, for they are not indigenous and their religion originated in a separate land. Later, M.S. Gorwalkar wrote, the foreign races in Hindustan must lose their separate existence to merge in the Hindu race or be staying the country only subordinated to the Hindu nation claiming nothing, deserving no privileges, far less any preferential treatment, not even citizens' rights. Hindutva forces were generally suspicious of secular ideas. Instead, Savarkar justified Hitler's treatment of Jews, and Munje even met Mussolini in, in Italy. 
but such ideas were at best marginal in the independence movement. Against this background, the Constituent Assembly started to write a constitution to serve multitudes of people. It chose an inclusive path, not just for moral, but for practical purposes. This path ensured India could transition to a nation where diverse groups peacefully coexisted. Note that India and Pakistan made contrarian ideological choices in 1947 and we consciously rejected a religious state. Vallabhai Patel, in a letter of 1947, famously wrote, and I quote his words, it would not be possible to consider Hindustan as a Hindu state with Hinduism as a state religion. We must not forget that there are other minorities whose protection is our primary responsibility. The state must exist for all irrespective of caste or creed. Our constitution makers thus chose a republican form of democracy to bring together a multicultural society where diversity could breathe and thrive. But there were two expectations from the state and people. The state, especially the enforcement wing, had to shed its colonial habits of treating the citizens always as a survival subject and minority faith communities had to become assured of their well-being in society and not to be inward-looking. To slowly foster fraternal relations with each other and together arrive at a path to social democracy. The constitution was firmly secular and egalitarian, declaring that the state shall not discriminate against any citizens on the ground of religion, race, caste, state, sex, place of birth, or any of them. The Constituent Assembly dealt with the idea of secularism considerably. H.V. Kamath proposed that the preamble begin with in the name of God, but many opposed this. Rodena Kunzru said that the invoking the name of God was inconsistent with the freedom of religion and was instead reflective of a narrow sectarian spirit. The Constituent Assembly, incidentally comprising an over 80% Hindu majority, embedded secularism in the Constitution in multiple ways through fundamental rights protecting religious freedoms, through a judiciary that could arbitrate religious concerns, and through an Indian model of secularism distinct from the Western church state model, respecting religious diversity and promoting tolerance and plurality, that is the Indian secularism. The Constituent Assembly also factored in the great deprivation facing India's poor, illiterate and highly undernourished, for whom the directive principles framework was created with a range of economic and social rights and mandating the state to abide by them fully. Closely connected to this was a stark social and economic inequality in the country. Ambedkar understood this well. To him, a healthy democracy meant more than just an independent judiciary or a free and fair election process. With great foresight, he cautioned the Constituent Assembly that political democracy would be inadequate if inequalities remain. In 1949, he said, and I must quote his, his, his words, on the 26th January 1950, we are going to enter into a life of contradictions. In politics, we will have equality, and in social and economic life, we will have inequality. In politics, we will be recognizing the principle of one man, one vote, and one vote, one value. In our social and economic life, we shall, by reason of our social and economic structure, continue to deny the principle of one man, one value. How long shall we continue to live this life of contradictions? How long shall we continue to deny equality in our social and economic life? If we continue to deny it for long, we will do it so only by putting our political democracy in peril. 
we must remove this contradiction at the earliest possible moment or else those who suffer from inequality will block the structure of political democracy which this assembly has so liberally built up he also said that in order to maintain democracy not merely in form but also in fact we needed to make our political democracy a social democracy as well he further said without equality liberty would produce the supremacy of the few over many equality without liberty would kill individual initiative without fraternity liberty and equality could not pick up a natural course of things arguably ladies and gentlemen india today celebrates at best only a political democracy we forget the other dimensions of the true democracy ambedkar had hoped india would have of economic and social democracy ambedkar was also deeply wedded to the idea of the democratic state run on the on the basis of morality without morality he believed the state would be reduced to anarchy this is how courts have also developed the concept of constitutional morality that is to respect and abide by what is contained in the constitution in spirit and not mere in letter the indian government indian experiment did not get off to a great start the constitution was only a map to secure an equal and prosperous future for all india still needed to build the nation certainly power structures have been inversely pushed towards inclusiveness but some complacency has allowed the extremist right wing and to inch into governance and everyday life let's begin with how political power has widened the mandal agitation the regional parties have secured greater participation of dalits and other oppressed classes in politics in states and the center constitutional amendments have helped decentralize governance structures at grassroots levels and introduce mandatory panchayat and nagar mahapalika elections while reservations for with reservations for women and sts and sts implementation may be imperfect i agree but neglected segments that from societies that form society's majority women oppressed classes have gained political voice and decision making authority fundamentally altering power structures india also inherited a strong culture of people's movements from the freedom struggle many from the earlier generations midnight children as they are sometimes called committed themselves to the nation building project mass movements the mkss narmada bachao andolan the chipko movement the various movements around women's rights effectively impacted law and policy making towards people's rights examples are the panchayat extension to scheduled area what is called pesa act the right to information food security laws the right to education mandrega midday meal scheme the forest rights act again implementation may be imperfect but these are hopefully here to stay every political party has had to acknowledge that for the indian state to remain legitimate social welfare is a must however these guarantees are also being chipped away we should be of grave concern to us ultimately india has a story of deep contradictions a middle class has grown but most of our population remains vulnerable with basic public goods being mostly deficient like education health livelihood employment or clean environment india's human development indicators are languishing barely higher than that of sub saharan africa while rhetoric and propaganda over the decades may have swayed us in truth as economist ashok modi has pointed out every indian government from nehru to modi has failed this country on delivering basic public goods and this is the reverse he says india faces a future of mass in employment with consequent discontent and even perhaps social violence this has led to a precipitating fall in the public in public trust 
for formal institutions such as courts, parliament, police and civilian bureaucracy. It started with emergency years, which were unquestionably the dark ages for India. This was when the Indian playbook for authoritarianism was first written, a terrifying trailer for times to come. Amity is society deteriorated and fissures along religious and caste lines deeper. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I see the rise of an illiberal and communal forces in India that is made possible in part by disillusionment with successive governments. This is compounded by a legal architecture that is permissive of abuse and prejudices inherent in the society. This worrying resurgence of communalism, a deeply divisive form of religious nationalism, has powerful political backing, seeking to realize Savarkar's ideal Hindu Rashtra, Hindu Zati, and Hindu Sanskriti. As a thought exercise, let us say Savarkar's theory. He believed that those whose sacred sites lie outside India's geographical sites limits cannot be Indian or would be lesser citizens. Thus, Muslims and Christians would be foreigners, not indigenous to India, because their religion originated elsewhere. By corollary then, as Rajmohan Gandhi in a previous Borkar lecture explained, explained, the millions of Hindus who live outside India cannot be Americans or South Africans or Fiji. All Indians living abroad would be second class citizens there. By extension, all Christians and Muslims living outside their holy lands would be suspect too. That the Savarkar's vision is outrageously outdated is putting it mildly. People are not defined by geography or religion, just as democratic nations are not chambers of rigid uniformity or isolation. Nevertheless, this glamorous view is being propounded in India today still to a point where minorities are living lives in fear and with some truth that their citizenship has been reduced to second class existence. Incidents like those in that, took, that took place in Mu or even in Delhi perpetuate this feeling. Extra judicial tools like encounter killings, panchayat bans on traders from minority communities and bulldozer politics have exacerbated this situation. The last situation is something that particularly troubles me. The bulldozer, bulldozer today has become a symbol of power that is weighted without legal sanction or authority. Innocent lives and livelihoods are lost with no respite in sight. It involves the physical demolition of homes on the mere suspicion that maybe someone living there has participated in riots or injured in some form of criminal violence or activity. Beyond the act of demolition, there are devastating consequences for entire families and communities. Who will help them to rebuild their destroyed lives, not just their homes? Does the state realize the grave implication of its machismo display? Those responsible for maintaining the rule of law, like courts, remain silent spectators. If I am not mistaken, there has not been a single case where innocent victims have found justice. When occasionally a bench, like in the Punjab and Haryana High Court, so much of questions the strong arm of the state, the case itself is taken away. The same story has played out in the case of hate speeches as well. Politicians and politically backed media outlets routinely foster communal hate. State and local governments are either explicit or inert. The Supreme Court tried to curb hate speech but to no avail and the cycle of violence and hatred continues. As another thought exercise, consider this. Hindus can never be denied their place in India. There is no evidence of Hindu faith facing a crisis of any kind in India. Fantastic claims of disproportionate Muslim population growth and love jihad are mere propaganda. Hindu nationalism, Hindu assertion or whatever term you may prefer 
will always have a place here. The right to free speech ensure that this voice exists. But when extremist right-wing groups take over and silence minorities, a state of hegemony comes about. Telling people what they can and cannot eat, wear, watch or speak about or whom they can, can or cannot marry amounts to imposing a homogeneous culture on non-conformists. In a democracy, this is a sure recipe for conflict. Ambedkar forewarned us about this. I feel that the idea of Hindutva, as we have received it today, challenges Hindu faith itself, which may consider, which many consider, a liberal, tolerant, and generous religion. Why is Hindu society largely silent to what is being perpetrated in the name of their religion against minorities? Is a question many of us might well ask today. Recall Vivekananda's memorable words from his 1893 Chicago address, where he said, We believe not only in universal toleration, but we accept all religions as true. And that he was proud to belong to a nation which had sheltered the persecuted and the refugees of all religions and all nations of the world. Should we not want to feel? that right always. The Hindu movement is marked by perpetuating victimhood and ousting scientific temper and rationality. Ambedkar's warning on this too was prescient. His vision of democracy emphasized that just as rationality can counter propaganda and ideological manipulation, a scientific spirit focusing on coherent arguments and clear evidence can protect people against the arbitrary exercise of power. But today, physical attacks on rationalists and polemical attacks on scientific spirit are being unleashed, with Narendra Dabhorkar, M. M. Kalburgi, Gauri Lankesh being some who paid with their lives. <coughs> Orthodoxy and suspicion have made a strong comeback. Surprisingly, even in the Indian National Indian Science Congress, the 2023 Congress included claims that Rangolis could ward off EVs. Previous editions have had a university vice chancellor tout Ravana's fleet of aircraft, and a paleontologist claim that dinosaurs were created by Brahma. Besides a discussion on India making test tube babies millennia ago, contrast this with Nehru's vision, where he encouraged Indian science beyond boundaries to realize that the sky is not the limit. Relatedly, education is being reshaped along ideological lines, which changes galore in school and university syllabi. At Delhi University, newspaper reports suggest that in the recently revised political science syllabus, teaching time given to thinkers like Gandhi, Kabir, Iqbal, Nehru, Raja Ramon Roy, Vivekananda Tower is sharply reduced, while time given to Savarkar and Hindu ideology has increased. BGP governments tried to rewrite school history textbooks in the year in early 2000. This year, they successfully removed much of Mughal history and material on dissent and communal violence in the NCERT syllabi, leading expert advisors, including Suhas Parshikar and Yogendra Yadav, to seek removal of their names from the new textbooks. I believe that the next stage of Hindutva movement, the birthing of the Hindu Rashtra is firmly in the works. Madhu Dandavte, in the 2000 Borkar lecture, prophetically said, and I quote his words, which are really prophetic, the hardliners of Hindutva who have a long-term objective to totally subvert secular character of constitution will work hard even up to 2047 to realize their objective. They will intensify frenzy among the people against secularism by waking up hatred against religious minorities and by strengthening Hindutva euphoria among the people and urging them to give two-third majority to the Hindutva forces so that secularism can be buried. Today, the ruling party has acquired democratic power legitimately after all, majority has been achieved in elections. 
But having been elected, the government is acting along starkly authoritarian lines, extinguishing checks and balances that characterize democracy. Watchdog institutions are mostly co-opted, while outliers are also fear-struck or paralyzed that they fail to express, expose, much less check, the abuse of power. The executive dominance that was set in during the emergency is thriving. Except this time, the issue is of destination, where we are going as a country. Executive power is nurturing a political culture and majority society incompatible with the constitutional ideal of India. The question is, just because it is done through legitimate political means, is India still definitionally a democracy? I have consistently maintained that we are, in fact, becoming quite the opposite, the, an elected, that is, an elected autocracy. And the Indian constitution, to quote the words of legal academic Tarnav Khetan, is being killed by a thousand cuts. Elected autocrats weaponize institutions for political emanation. Big media and private sector are silenced. Rules are redrafted to suit their own interest. Critical voices still rise up, and, but dissenters and questioners end up at the receiving end of all kinds of trouble. In this way, the very institutions of democracy are used to kill it. Our failed early years, we have seen, contributed to creating conditions favorable for the rise of an elected autocracy. To name a few, the almost militant social movement of the Hindutva right wing, a hollowed out and discredited opposition, weakened media and courts have created, in some ways, a perfect storm for the Indian state. Today, Institutions are weakened in explicit and implicit ways. We see a lack of transparency in campaign finance through the OPEC system of the so-called electoral bonds, which the Supreme Court is yet to adjudicate upon. We also see active efforts to dilute the autonomy of election commission, an institution that has been blatantly partisan in recent years. The Supreme Court's efforts to reform the Chief Election Commissioner's selection process was undone through proposing an amendment to the Selection Committee composition, removing the Chief Justice of India nominally an independent and a political voice. Institutions are killed insidiously. Authorities intended to monitor accountability, such as Lokpal, the Chief Information Commissioner, the National Human Rights Commission, today appears to exist only on paper. The Lokpal was created with the best of intentions and designated to serve as an ombudsman to tackle corruption amongst, high public, uh, amongst public functionaries. But of the thousands of complaints it has received since it was set up, the Lokpal has either not registered the complaints at all or dismissed them outright. What purpose does it really serve at all, one might ask. The collapse of the right to information regime has been perhaps the most spectacular. Meant as a sunshine law to dispel the darkness surrounding governance and policy making, this path breaking law has been virtually killed by not making appointments or appointing loyalists and not giving out information while also enacting a tight fisted data protection law. Federal relations are also being destroyed today through partisanal governors issuing dictates to non-BJP governed states. My friend, uh, Justice Chandru, called these governors as, uh, uh, as uh, 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 weapons of, uh, weapons of uh, disruption, mass disruption. <laughs> Separately, investigating authorities like the CBI, the ED, and the NIA, otherwise expected to conduct non-partisan inquiries are today being deployed as arms of state against political opposition, independent media, dissenters. These are not new tactics. I understand that this was done even by the pre 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 previous governments. But this has 
but it has been misused in unprecedented ways by the present dispensation. There is also no media, print or electronic, worthy of being called truly independent, barring some exceptions. Indeed, the media has contributed to the growth of sentiment of hatred in this country. All of this collectively are the markers of failing democracy. Closely connected to this is the clear pattern of government suppressing dissent and criminalizing inconvenient speech and expression. Examples are countless, I will quote few, such as the arrest of Disha Ravi for circulating a protest kit, arrest for questioning cow urine as a COVID cure, the, uh, the arrest of journalists like Patricia Mukhim for criticizing the government in a social media post, the raid on activist Harsh Mandar's premises, the arrest of a stand-up comedian Munawar Faruqi, internet and internet uh, the, and communication blockouts are routine, such as during farm, farmers' protests or in Jammu and Kashmir or in Manipur. Some might argue, oh, there are positive developments with new laws being made and old ones being repealed. Do not get me wrong. India desperately needs new laws. We remain reliant on antiquated laws dating back over 150 years. But instead of actually thinking through new legal structures, we are being given this, this new legal law and the, the new criminal laws. These are nothing but be given old wine in new bottles. They were sprung upon an unsuspecting population seemingly not considering the decade-long criminal law reform debate. This, is a, this could be a subject for a separate, separate speech. Bombastic statement that this is the end of the colonial legal legacy and that Macaulay's, Macaulay's name now stands erased are in fact misleading. Most of the old laws in fact continue, even retaining the same language. To complicate things, the new laws add extra layer of ambiguity and do not increase civil individual liberties, but reduce them, such as the provision of sedition. It strikes particularly that the Home Ministry, which is pushing the new laws, believes that criminal reform simply means la longer incarcerations and stricter punishments and nothing else. Finally, the judiciary, the last bastion. When it comes to courts, so much has been said that I'm not even sure where to begin or end and what to include or, or leave out. In recent years, the Supreme Court has some exceptional judgments and Anup mentioned about the right to privacy being a path-breaking work of jurisdiction. More immediately, there have been positive orders such as those pertaining to Manipur and Haryana, the order of hate speech, the, on, on hate speech, the bail order in Bhima Korega violence case. But the judiciary has not managed to effectively curb executive excesses and there is a visible general reluctance to hear big ticket matters like the Citizenship Amendment Act or electoral bonds. Electoral bonds is, is be pending before the Supreme Court for the last four years and there is no end. We do not see when this is going to be taken. We, the elections are next year. This is compounded by a perceptible targeting of those fighting for justice without following due process. Tista Settlewar's case is a classic example of this. Courts seem not only dismissing cases, but practically supporting the government in going after activists. Human rights defenders are regularly persecuted by employing anti-terror laws, and especially the Unlawful Activities Prevention Act, which is called, which is in short, UAP Act. In particular, the Supreme Court's interpretation of the grant of bail in the UAPA case has appended the principle of presumption of innocence under law in the case of NIA versus Zahir Ahmad Shah Watali. Now the courts are to presume the prosecution case to be true and then determine whether a prima case is made out for grant of bail or not. As a result, for anyone unfortunate to have been charged under UAPA, it has been the, uh, it will be indefinitely incarcerated for a, for a long number of months or years. 
The UAPA has been particularly used and abused in many cases, including Bhima Koregao and Delhi riots cases. Some who were arrested, accused and arrested Kore, Bhima Koregao or Delhi riots cases, the, like Sudha Bharadwaj, some, I mean, they were, the, she got eventually got the bail, but man like Stan Swami, a 85-year-old person, and you should read about his case. A court itself noted that the man is suffering from Alzheimer's. He cannot stand, he cannot write, he cannot hold even a, even a glass in his hand. And he died without identifying any incrementing evidence against him. In a recent order, in the same Bhima Koregao case, the Supreme Court said that these are mere tall allegations. There is nothing against the accused. This was the ground for, for granting bail to the so few other accused. But uh, Swami unfortunately died. It does not help that the high courts, barring some honorable exceptions, are also unable to discharge the kind of truly independent roles as they had in the past. I feel per personally troubled by this because my own professional career has been tied to high courts. The high courts were once the most vibrant institutions in the country. Indeed, high courts have an enviable legacy of being among the only democratic institutions that stood with, with and for the citizens in the country's darkest days during the emergency, while the Supreme Court failed India's people. But like so much of history, that legacy seems to have been forgotten. On occasion, such as during COVID and the plight of migrant workers, High Court showed their mettle so through some bold orders and directions. But it seems that this was only a, a momentary ray of hope. Today, it is virtually impossible to get reliefs in civil, civil liberties cases in some High Courts. And for even the most blatantly ridiculous instances of misuse or arbitrary application of draconian law, individuals have to approach the Supreme Court for any redress. It is also troubling to see that the High Court judges praising the benefits of cow urine and cow dung, invoking the manusmriti and speaking the majority in language. Despite all this, ladies and gentlemen, the executive realizes that judiciary is the last bastion it has to overcome. In that respect, without a formal change in the constitution, it might be almost impossible to establish a Hindu Rashtra. This is also perhaps why a conversation has suddenly resumed around the Keshwananda Bharti decision. The statesmanship exhibited by the 13 judge constitution bench in Keshwananda Bharti, where the basic structure doctrine was laid down and judicially, judi judicial custody of the, uh, of the Constitution reclaimed is but one shining example of what the Supreme Court is capable of. The judgment spoke of six crucial elements that made a basic structure that cannot be altered. That is democracy, secularism, rule of law, equality, federalism, and judicial independence. As the Chief Justice of India has rightly said, this decision is a North Star for India Granville Austin said that the court had established itself as the logical pri primary custodian of the constitution and its interpreter and guardian. There was a promise decades ago by the Supreme Court itself that sorry, there was a promise decades ago by the Supreme Court itself that it would be the sentinel on P5, the watchful guardian protecting citizens' fundamental rights. Whatever happened to that promise, I often wonder with great disappointment. You might well ask why I have painted what appears to be a rather grim picture of what India has become in 2023, and why I think this is important for what my vision of India in, 2020, in 2047. Every day, with increasing frequency, we are bombarded with claims about the achievements of the government and how people's lives have improved and how lives will continue to get better with time. Uh, but if we think about this rationally, with proper data, information, and evidence, we'll be able to look past the pomp and rhetoric for what, what really is. Consider, for instance, 
the economic miracle that India is being touted as the, by the present government. We are told to be proud that India is now shining and that our economy will soon overtake the world's biggest and brightest. But a closer examination reveals that this economy appears to be shining only for a very few. In the world's major indices, just let me cite those all 12 important indices where the countries country is measured on its development. In world's major indices that measure different aspects of governance, India regularly show up nearer to the bottom of these lists than the top. On the Global Hunger, hunger Index, which measures hunger and food security, India is presently ranked at 107 out of 117. On the Environmental Performance Index, which talks about how governments handle air and water pollution, amongst other things, India has the unenvious position of being at the bottom of 180 countries measured. In the Human Development Index, the Gender Gap Index, the Multidimensional Poverty, Poverty Index, India has routinely performed poorly with only marginal or occasional improvement. Not only India has done poorly compared to with itself, but also compared with its immediate neighbors like Bangladesh and larger neighborhoods. What does this all tell us? I feel that this march towards creating a certain kind of India has resulted in what some have called an amnesia about of teeming millions. The sad truth is, for many of us, the working classes, the lower middle and lower classes, the agricultural workers, they just do not exist. They are unseen, unheard, or ignored, living substandard lives, left to languish in the dark alleyways, in scorched farms, in flooded hillsides, in posh villages. But if you introspect about this bit little deeply, you will realize they are irreplaceable cogs in the wheel of our democracy as we are. Nobody can contest that income inequality has become stark. There appears to be no meaningful investment in the health and education, those who really need it. Corruption and chronic capitalism are still very much prevalent, except with new faces and new names, perhaps more demonic than we knew them to be before. But the situation that we are today is not irreversible. To reverse this, we must jolt, jolt ourselves awake with a few realizations. And this is how I wish to conclude my speech. We need to recognize that communism is not only the badge of a backward nation, as Nehru had famously once said, but also that it has a limited shelf life. Recall what I had said at the start of my lecture today, that history has a lot to teach us. History has taught us time and again that hatred and divisiveness, whether in politics or society, cannot survive for long. Religion and religious groups might be having their day in the sun when it comes to influencing politics and economics. This is happening the world over. But this is also only a temporary phenomenon. Peacefulness and peaceful society is a natural equilibrium for human society. Periods of war and instability have mostly been sporadic. We have, as humankind, reverted to peace as the default. In India too, we must never let go that certitude that we will return to peace sooner than later. For every statue of Gandhi or Tagore being defaced or pulled down, or their thoughts and ideas being otherwise devalued by the extremist right wing, there is a moment that reminds us and reinforces that the peace is the only path for the real progress. We must also acknowledge and learn to value the power of knowledge. This means encouraging free and critical thought and speech. What this means for institutional architecture is obvious. Schools and universities, places where people go to ideate and create, and avenues through which such ideas and creations are consumed, such as the media must be truly independent, free from fear and control. So at the end of all this, you might ask, what is my vision for India of 2047, I would return unhesitatingly to history. 
the universal values that have survived since time immemorial that will survive for time to come the values of truth non violence compassion and kindness these are what must define my india of 2047 these values must guide government and society these values must direct them to behave in ways that uphold human goodness dignity diversity and inclusivity over millennia even before india existed as a nation the people of this subcontinent have shown themselves to be very resilient there is so much strength in india and indians i am confident that we can reverse the situation we have found ourselves today thank you very much thank you justice shah for uh, as always unsparingly delivering the truth so powerfully uh, thank you so much for that um, may i now request the chair justice sanjay kishan call to deliver his address please Sepisha Professor Anup Surendranath Swas and the whole family of the Bokas Hem and Girija who were uh, contemporaries of my daughter that's how I came to know them ladies and gentlemen esteemed guests fellow citizens very good evening to all of you uh, it's a great honor to stand before all of you today on the auspicious occasion as we celebrate the 25th edition of the ds borkar memorial lecture series as we mark the silver jubilee celebrations of this wonderful lecture series uh, it just makes me realize how remarkable this platform has been not only for uh, paying tribute to the legacy of a remarkable individual but also in spurring critical conversations about the future of our nation The list of the past speakers in this event have been nothing short of illustrious and Mr. Shah's addition to the list today only affirms the importance of the event. Together we reflect in the past, ponder in the present, and envision the future of India as we stand just two decades away from the 100th anniversary of our independence. India is a very wide, varied nation. uh what is called the khan pan lehja uh, where everything is so varied as we see the country it's more diverse and varied than the whole of europe according to my belief and so more difficult to govern because the one person was or a group has to govern europe that would be a great challenge uh it is in this context we must understand a lot of our problems and how we move towards the future on how the series was set up dataji was a visionary who devoted his life to serving the society in multi faceted ways his contributions span various domains from literature to social reform and his legacy continues to inspire us today a prolific writer a visionary editor and a committed social worker ds borkar was not just a man of words but a man of action it shows how in a continued expanse of life uh, there is no age when you stop doing something to contribute to the society and that's what he was and that's how i've seen swahas do it uh, his literary prowess was matched only by his deep commitment to a betterment of society i believe creation of wealth by itself is not something wrong it's a question of utilization of the wealth which arises thereafter so in many countries if you see creation of wealth is also matched by a large contribution to causes uh primary among them is education uh 
there are people who feel that it's better to possibly give something to a religious uh, uh, institution rather than to education. And that's where somewhat the problem lies. Uh, something which I admire in, in the American society is that people who make a large amount of money contribute to education in a great way. It's the, the alumni of the, the institution which are responsible for what the educational institutions are. I do believe it is starting to, uh, you know, take root here. One reason could be that that kind of wealth was not available in India to do so, but we have seen recent example of, of uh, very, very highly respectable business people contributing to education. Therefore, uh, addressing the issues which Mr. Borker thought about, education, women empowerment, social justice, uh, are extremely important. I have believed that empowerment of women arises from fundamentally education and the ability to be self-independent. It is these two factors which give strength to the women to contribute equally to the society. And I've seen many examples of this change also because there are many positive notes also in whatever is going on. One of the issues which is often flagged is that the uh, there is a absence of enough number of the genders in the judiciary. And uh, I used to say, well, there was a time when lady lawyers did not represent that section. So suddenly one fine day you can't do it. But on a positive note, as I have gone to different states in different places, I have seen the percentage of women judges, at least at the subordinate judiciary level, rising to an extent of one-third plus. So something even recently as I went to Bihar, a large contribution from the national law schools, uh, more than 33 percent for women. In Delhi, quite a number of years back, and Delhi is different from the others, uh, I was part of a selection process where 73 percent uh, recruitment was of women. So it's a change which takes place and it's easier to bring laws but sometimes it's more difficult without a social change to bring that norms into force. And that's I think a phase which India is going through. <coughs> Changes are occurring but maybe at a slower pace. The the purpose of a series like this is to have different thought processes, contra pro. I believe everybody has a right to think and say what he feels like it. Uh, and I've said so on many occasions, as it's a right for an author to write what he wants, there's a right of a painter to paint what he wants. These are part of our society. And there'll be people of different hues in Christ because we are such a diverse nation by itself. Uh, what we have to learn is, of course, to accept a different point of view, to agree to differ, but in a nice manner to differ. I think that's where the fundamental lies. In uh, the world that is rapidly changing, this lecture series uh, serves as a compass that guides our collective aspirations. Uh, it has encouraged us to envision a nation that upholds its democratic values, embrace inclusivity, harness technology for the greater good, and continues to serve for equitable growth. As Mr. Shah said, yesterday was a momentous moment for something to be proud of. Therefore, I believe in different fields there are many marks which are to be proud of. The fact that uh, an 18 years old young man is in the final of a chess, I don't know what happened to the results thereafter, is also a reflection of how a society moves. Uh, on, on Justice Shah, uh, his accomplishments as a jurist are not only commendable but also truly transformative. The Nas Foundation is, is something which, uh, which shines out. And uh, we have with us uh, also Justice Murli who partnered him in this effort. Uh, 
I had a very small contribution in that other person. Uh, I had just joined the bench when this matter came up for admission. So I told my senior judge, uh, we must admit it. So he passed an order of admission. Then he, I said, uh, sir, we must uh, list it for hearing. He said, you are being very adventurous at the very beginning of your career. And I realized maybe it's for some things time has not come. This is my realization over a period of time. If you follow that one case history, it moved from admission to a summary dismissal, to a movement to the Supreme Court, to a summary sending back saying this is not how to deal with it. And then fortunately a bench which uh, took it on. Then again to the Supreme Court where it did not succeed and time passed. And over a period of time, the society also changed, the thought process also changed. As that changed, we have seen a different signal today. So, therefore, my belief that uh, societal changes are dependent on how the society reacts. We often tend to uh, put the, I would not say the burden, but the flag on uh, uh, the executive, the political system, the judiciary. But they emerge from the same society. If, if uh, the society's honesty level is X percentage, then institutions will reflect that X percentage in some manner or the other. So I do believe each of us in the society have a responsibility in whatever we are doing, both to bring about a change and contribute towards what is happening. I think we, if, if each of us accepts that responsibility in our own way, the judge in his own way, the bureaucrat in his own way, the politician in his own way, and the large expanse of common people in their own ways. I, I think we will be a better society and move at a faster pace. The Shah has been part of many reform processes as a chairman of the Law Commission, uh, streamlining uh, the commercial litigation of it and other areas. But to change laws, to change areas, public debate becomes a very important part. It is a participative public debate which gives rise to a, a long time movement and development which must take place. And today we have technology. It's not a problem of how to do so. It's very easy to have public domain debated. Uh, I believe contra point of views can be expressed in a better manner. That's the fundamental issue I have that, you know, uh, we as society sometimes tend to take extreme positions without uh, following what has been the middle path. Because the middle path recognizes that I may differ from you, but yet I have to learn how to exist with a difference with you. And I think that's the challenge for the country in times to come. Uh, if you look to the legacy of the person in whose honor this is being held, the idea is to inspire us to continue pursuit of justice, uphold principles of democracy, and work towards a nation that respects the rights and dignity of every individual. After all, our constitutional makers gave us a great constitution. We got a right to vote for everybody uh, at a time when many European nations had to see this much later, including right of women to vote. Uh, voting right, whether you're educated or uneducated. And the Indian public, I believe, has shown in time as it co goes on. They have a very early sense. They have an early sense of how to go about things. It is reflective at times in voting for, say, an assembly and, and a Lok Sabha very differently. They do understand what they want. Yes, uh, there are, we are a society with various ramifications of caste, creed, color, and all those problems, but we are uh, still 75 years young. Many societies have taken much longer to reach uh, where we have. And I'm sure uh, the next 25 years, uh, willingly if the people work and walk forward will be something to look forward to. 
Closing, let us embrace the lessons from our past, acknowledge the challenges of our present, and boldly envision the India we want to see in 2047, a nation that embodies the ideas of freedom, equality, and progress. Together, let us ensure that a flame of our aspiration continues to burn brightly, lighting the path towards a brighter and more prosperous future. Thank you and Jay. Thank you, Justice Call, for that strong message of uh, advising all of us to say that there must be space for contrarian views and the manner in which those contrarian views are to be reconciled. Um, uh, this is now time for me to sum up today's uh, lecture and, and also the address by Justice Call. Um, I, I teach a law of evidence to 20-year-old students, right? And, and I think one of the fundamental conversations we have there is how valuable is truth as a value for the legal system, right? Um, right? Is, is truth the only value that the legal system is interested in? How, and that conversation could be had at a much larger scale of society as well, that is society driven only by truth, right? And, and I think the co is to think that there are multiple values that are driving the legal system, that is driving society. And, and, and what I was reflecting on as, as, the, as the lecture and the address of the chair was happening was, I think there's a sort of fundamental issue to address in terms of do we all agree that a, what, where are we currently? Uh, what are the terms on which we would like to assess where we are as a society, as a democracy, where our constitutional system is, where our rule of law is? I think that battle for the truth of what, how exactly do we characterize where we are right now? Uh, I think many of us in this room would agree to a certain version of that. Uh, we would value certain things more than certain other things. But I wonder if whether that, that assessment is shared by uh, many people outside this room. And I think that's the challenge. How do we, uh, this concern that we have, and many of the concerns that Justice Shah expressed today, um, that conversation that uh, cannot just remain in rooms like this. Uh, and, and that, for me, is a very fundamental issue in terms of, A, what is the assessment of the problem? What is the direction in which we go? There seems to be so little agreement on the values that must drive us as a society. Um, and just one last point. Um, I think we must worry about the weaponizing of the rule of law. Right, uh, that the rule of law, best of time at the best of times, uh, was a con is and was a contested concept because of because law necessarily does not mean justice, and that that this assumption that the law will always deliver justice, uh, we I think we take it for granted far too often, and 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 I think what we are seeing right now is weaponizing the rule of law. Right, that that you are using law. Uh, uh, as an instrument of force, of violence, and that presents certain fundamental challenges to our constitutional democracy. Uh, I think we're just still coming to terms with that. Um, I'll, I'll stop my reflections with that. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Uh, thank you, Justice uh, Shah, for such a thought-provoking and uh, unsparing lecture, as I said. And, uh, uh, thank you, Justice Call, for saying how we might think of the way ahead uh, from the current set of circumstances that we find ourselves in. Um, finally, now, may I request all of you to please rise for the national anthem.
Thank you and have a good evening.